Hey everybody, uh, Jeff Kibbe here uh, with Metastock. That's got another uh, exciting webinar for you today. Uh, one of my favorite presenters as well. So let's go ahead and kick it off uh, with your favorite part. No, this is your favorite part. Uh, today's demonstration is designed to instruct you on using Metastock, the accompanying software plugins. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell, but rather guidelines to interpreting and using specific indicators and features within the software. The information, software, and techniques presented today should only be used by investors who are aware of the risk inherent in trading. Uh, Metastock should have no liability for any investment decisions based on the use of the software, any trading strategies, or any information provided in connection with the company. I agree with that, and let's you know just so, so you know, I could say the same thing. <laughs> Do you want to say I it again? Don't have, I don't have it memorized. <laughs> All right, Don. Uh, Don Fishback is our guest today. You can hopefully you guys can hear him pretty good. Has a great uh, booming voice, a voice that makes me jealous a little bit. Uh, but Don is uh, somebody that's been involved with Metastock for longer than I have, which is pretty unusual <laughs> for the partners that we work with. Uh, I really like the kind of the strategies that he implements. Um, he came with me to us a couple years ago with some ideas that, about things that he wanted to do with his uh, with kind of like a squeezing and volatility, and uh, so we embarked on another project. And it's a fantastic product. Uh, Don's going to talk to you a lot about it today. And uh, let's go ahead and. Get you on here, Don. Don, I know you want to talk a little bit about yourself. What do you want to tell us? Oh, well, hi, Jeff. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, let me just begin by I have been in the financial services business for, all right, you got me going? Uh, you're going. Okay, I'm going to hit this right there. And... Yeah, I have my own disclaimer, by the way, so you can see it right there. I am not, I do not have it memorized like Jeff does, so I'm going to just let you see it. Uh, but a little bit about me, uh, I am the developer of ODDS. Uh, it stands for Options and Derivatives Decision Support. And um, what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at... Uh, a, a couple of systems that has some key advantages, and one is based on proven research. It's repeatable. It's very fast, and you're going to learn today why it works, and that's going to mean that you have confidence. So about me, um, Jeff, I am the president of Fishback Management Research. It's a company I started back in 1993, and our motto is we make options easy, and I have been widely recognized as the world's leading authority on helping people instantly make options investing easier, more profitable and less risky so that you can enjoy the peace of mind that comes with financial freedom. And not only that, I'm also widely recognized as one of the world's foremost experts in the field of probability and its application to options. Now a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I am, I've been in the financial services business since 19, 1984, so I'm now in my 32nd year of this, and I have, I started off as a broker, and then I was an analyst at the nation's largest options only research boutique. I was director of research there, and then in 1993 I went out on my own. While I was at that research boutique, uh, that's when I came into contact with the folks at Metastock. I believe it was 1988, uh, back, when, back before Windows. So we were using a DOS version of a program called uh, the Technician. And I think Metastock had just come out. Um, and uh, Metastock, it was, I think that ran in DOS as well. And I use the technician religiously, got to know the people uh, at, out in Salt Lake City. They were just the, the best. I got the best support you can possibly imagine. Um, and I use a lot of, I used Metastock and I used the technician in a lot of the research 
that eventually got published in uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Barron's, Forbes. I've I've been interviewed on NPR, just some some of the places that you might not expect. And speak of because NPR being one of them, but speaking of something that you really wouldn't expect is that my comments have I've, I've even been cited as an expert on probability and its application to the financial markets in the New England Journal of Medicine. I think that's something that Jeff just learned a little bit earlier today. So um, at any rate, uh, for those of you, and one of the things, by the way, prior to the webinar getting started, I noticed Jeff put up some polls for people to tell us like where they're located and uh, diff you know what kind of trading they do. And one of the interesting poll results was the number of people that do have Metastock and the number of people that don't. And I was really surprised that 38% of the people do not have Metastock. I was, I was really surprised about that. I thought it would have been a higher, uh, a lower number than that and that more people would have had Metastock. But at any rate, for the people that uh, do have Metastock, this might be maybe not the same colors that you might be accustomed to, but you might have seen this thing uh, called the odds probability cone. It is down in this right here, the odds probability cone right there. This is something that I, you know, Jeff talking about us working together. Uh, this was, this is uh, almost 20 years that this has been a part of Metastock, and it's now, it is now a part of nearly every options broker's platform. If you have uh, Trade Monster, Thinkorswim, or uh, I don't know if uh, I uh, don't know. I think Fidelity has it. Um, all of them have these probability cones now, and this ha probability cone happens to be drawn at the one standard deviation band. Now for those of you who remember your high school math, you remember the teacher said, you know, you pay attention because someday, someday you might just need this. Well today's, it's, I, I won't say I'm going to get into logarithms and too much in standard deviations, but one thing I want you to, I do want you to remember about your high school math with respect to standard deviation is that about two-thirds of all outcomes lie between plus and minus one standard deviation. Well, we can, if this is the one standard deviation band, and basically it tells us that if it's, if anything inside the cone is within one standard deviation and anything outside the cone, outside one standard deviation, and we know that about two-thirds of the time, it should be within that cone, within that one standard deviation. Well, we can just count. So here's one year. This, this is actually going out one year. So one year it's within, and it, we're not looking at the in-between. In we're looking at where it ends up. So one year we're in-between. There's one, two. Well, let's see how many years we've got. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10 years, and we are inside, 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 outside, inside, 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 outside, and inside. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I always like to double check. Uh, we've got 10 possible years, and only two times was it out outside of that. So where the the, the normal bell curve says that it's going to lie between plus and minus one standard deviation about 66% of the time. It actually, as you can see from this chart, it's actually about 80% of the time, and it's actually a little bit higher than that. It's When you look at more years than that, it's about 85% of the time it's within plus and minus one standard deviation. So I want to give you a little bit of a hint. We're going to look at something later. Uh, 
the uh, the market moves outside that probability cone less frequently than the theoretical models predict. So that's going to be something important that we're going to look at here in a little while. So what we're going to do is, and if you think about this, if with options you want, if you buy an option, you want a big move. Well, if it doesn't move outside that cone, it's not a big enough move to profit from an options purchase. So what we need to do is we need to find a situation. If we're going to buy options, we need to find a situation where the stock is poised to move outside that range. And so what we're going to do, you're going to learn tonight, we're going to spot high profit options trades on stocks that are flat for no fundamental reason. And we're going to do that by finding stocks that are compressed. So we're going to look for compressed situations. Now, this is anything, it's different than anything we've ever taught before. It's all new. It's not covered in the uh, prior odds expert, which has been in part of Metastock for um, 18 years now. And it's not part of the exploration. So this is, this is all new. Uh, and yet, and yet it's the same because it's based on the principle of finding a flat stock that has gotten too compressed. So the, the principle, the basic principle is the same, finding a stock that's flat. But the method of finding the flat stock has gotten better. We've, we've been able to improve it. Now, again, I've explained what this is. So we've got... Uh, we're looking for situations where the stock is going to move outside that probability cone. Like this. This is from last summer. This is the S&P 500 depository receipt, the SPY. And you can see, here's the probability cone. And it moved way outside of it. It moved way, way, way outside of it. So if you had put on the right type of option strategy expecting a big move, then this would have been extremely profitable. And with the right strategy, it could have gone up by a similar amount and you would have made money. You're, so we're looking for a non-directional bet, a non-directional options play so that we don't have to be concerned about is the stock going up, is it going down? No, I don't, I don't care. I just want it to go. So every, that, that's what we're looking at. That's what we're looking for. And the, the indicators that are going to tell us that something like that has happened, they're moving averages. And I'm going to tell you, it was actually, I got the idea from just playing around with Metastock. I think it was Metastock 13. Um, because I think it's either Metastock 12 or Metastock 13, um, and I was just it was it was all new. It was it was whatever one, and I don't know if uh, Jeff can tell you um, when the uh, Jeff can tell you a little bit more about it because um, it was whenever the ex explorer or the uh, the uh, forecaster. When the forecaster came in, it was all new, and they had this. I was messing around with it, and they had a series of templates in there. They had some templates, some brand new templates that weren't in prior versions of Metastock, or I had never fooled around with them. And I was just messing around, and I saw this thing, Daryl Guppy MMA. It's like, what the heck is that? So I clicked on it, and I noticed something with, when I brought this chart up, it was like, oh my gosh, this is, this. I might be able to use this with options trading. And here's the template, and there's the Daryl Guppy MMA. There's the template right there. And you can see it's just a bunch of moving averages. And you have some short-term moving averages here, and you have some long-term moving averages right there. And they go up and down and up and down and so on and so forth. And then I want you to look what happens right over here. 
right there. Now look at the. I want you to look at the gap between this one and this one. There's a huge gap, and there's a huge gap between this one and this one. So the highest one and the lowest one, and the highest one and the lowest one, and so on and so forth. The difference in the gap. And now look at the difference between the highest moving average and the lowest moving average. Do you see how they're all concentrated into one little itty bitty point? And then look what happens. Kaboom. The stock just completely falls out of bed. Well, that's what we're looking for right there. Something like that. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a series of moving averages to converge. And then what we do, it's a real simple math equation. You just get the, get the moving averages, and then you determine the highest value. And let's just, we'll just call that high. And then you get the lowest moving average, and we'll just call that low. So right here, we call this high, and we call this low right here, it would be hard to tell, but we can do it numerically. And then we take the highest high and the lowest low, and we divide it by the close. And when you do that, you get what's called the odds volatility compression ratio. So that's what we're going to call the odds volatility compression ratio. And that is this indicator right there. And it goes up and down, and you can see it got really low right in here and all this period right there. So that's what we're looking for. And then when this indicator reaches an extremely low level, when that indicator, when that ratio reaches an extremely low level, the moving averages have converged to the point that the asset, in this case it's an ETF, but it could be a stock, uh, it could be, uh, I think it could be any asset, I, I don't know anything about uh, other markets, uh, but I use this on stocks exclusively, and when it gets to that point, when it gets to that point, the stock is extremely compressed, and at that point, you're likely to see a very large move. Well, we have a, um, an add-on that will identify these kinds of situations very, very easily. It's, it's, you just, it's, it, it's just push a button and you can get all the work done for you. But that just gives you the compressed stock, which is right, again, that's what we've got right here. It's, this is, so this would be an example. The probability cone is not part of the add-on because it's right there. Uh, but the rest of this is part of the add-on. And this is, this is what you would see if you use the add-on and you use the probability cone. But this just gives you the fact that the stock is compressed. The next question is, okay, so so what? I mean, that's what we all want to know, right? So what? You know, what? What's it going to do for me? If it doesn't give me a way to make money, then it really doesn't. It really doesn't serve any purpose other than it's it's an uh, it's entertaining to know that. But you know, we are here as traders. We're here for more than entertainment value. We're here for uh, a way that we can add to our knowledge so that we can implement that and potentially make money. So to make money from a situation where a stock is likely to make a big move, you need to use options. And the option strategy we're going to use is to buy a straddle. We're going to buy a straddle. Well, the question is, OK, I can buy a straddle. What is a straddle? Because I know there may be some of you who are not familiar with options and don't know some of the nomenclature. Well, a straddle is the simultaneous purchase of a call option and a put option 
with the same strike price and the same options expiration date. So in options, they all have strike prices. So if you have a stock at 50, it may have option strike prices at 48, 49, 50, 51, and so on and so forth. And that's the, that's the price at which you could exercise the option if you chose to do the exercise. So the option strike price has a lot to do with, in fact, it has almost everything to do with the price of the option, with the, the exercise value of the option. The time value is the other component of an option price. That's really based on the magnitude of the uh, stock price swings, the expected magnitude of the stock price swings, and the amount of time left on the option. So strike price is very important to options in terms of exercise value. Well, the strike price that we are looking for, um, I, the, the uh, strike price that we are looking for is the one that's closest to the strike price. So if you had a stock price at 50, then you would look at the 50 call. That's the, that were the 50 call and put. That's the strike price that is closest to the current stock price. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, you need to say, with an option, you need to choose an expiration date. So uh, we suggest that you, do to s that you do some testing to see which one you find is best. And the reason I say that is I want you to make sure that it suits your personality. For instance, and this is important, you need to make sure that if you if, if you don't like real rapid action, then you don't want to be trading weekly options. If you like if if you don't like um, if, if if you if you like things that are uh, more stable, you want to be trading long-term options. Vice versa, if you like the action, don't be trading three-month options. There's no there's there's no need for it. Uh, you want to so make sure you choose something that suits your temperament. Now, the one thing about this is you do need to make sure that you give it at least some time for a catalyst to come along because I'll just go back to this chart right here. You had the real flat period right there where the uh, moving averages converged. Well, what was, the, what was the catalyst that came along? Well, right here, China devalued their currency. And that's what caused the stock market in the U.S. The, the Chinese market got hammered. Well, the stock market got hammered. And the U.S. market got hammered as well. So that was the catalyst that drove the stock market lower. So you need to be sure when you're choosing your expiration, make sure it suits your personality, but also make sure you give it plenty of time to um, make sure you give it plenty of time for a catalyst to come along. Now, once you choose your option, so you let's say you get a signal today. And typically, I try and go maybe uh, I try I, I try and go about three weeks or so. You know, nothing. I don't want to go too long. I don't want to go too short. Well, that would correspond with the March options expiration, the third fr the third Friday of March. So that's a, that would be the uh, ex the the expiration date. And let's say the stock was at 50, then I would be buying the 50 call and put. So I say buy the March 50 call and buy the March 50 put. Well, what price do I pay? What's what? Because you have to know the price in order to. You don't want to overpay for options. Um, what we're going to use is we're going to use what we call FOV, and that's the fishback option value. So that's going to be the thing that we use. But first I want to do a quick discussion of probability. 
this is the old way of looking at probability. This is a chart. Gosh, this is from Excel. And remember I told you about the math and the high school teacher. We, we all probably remember this from high school math. And we're looking at standard deviations down here. So here's 0, standard deviations, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and so on and so forth. And this is, so let's just, oh, let's see if I can get the drawing utensils. And I'm not going to be able to get the drawing utensils. So, uh, but let's just imagine this area right in here, this area between plus and minus one standard deviation, that's about two-thirds of the area under the bell curve. Well, that's where we get probability. That's where we get the probability of profit using, uh, using volatility. Uh, what we can then, and I want to just move to this one, this, this bar right here shows the one standard deviation line right here. Well, like I told you, that corresponds to this line right here. So if you were to say uh, convert this line to the bell curve, it would be right at this vertical bar here. And then on the lower side it would be right over here. So that's the one standard deviation. Well that is, it's a great way of estimating things. It's, I find it very interesting that you can, it's, it's what we call a closed form solution. You've got an equation that you can use and it'll give you uh, probabilities. It's, it's, it's a great way to estimate things, but we're going to make an improvement on that. And the way we're going to improve things is we're going to do something very, very simple. And that is we are just going to, we're just going to count. Um, so that is, when, when I talk about that, uh, we're just, instead of saying that using an equation to calculate the probabilities and how frequently it might end up in this area, we're going to actually count how many times did the stock stand still, how many times did it move down a half a percent, how many times did it move down one percent or one and a half percent or two percent. So this is a way that by just counting we can actually um, we can actually get the uh, a more accurate picture of what a stock actually does or what a, uh, what an index actually does. So this is something that I developed actually back in 1996. Uh, I was uh, a subscriber to Larry McMillan's newsletter. Larry's a great guy if you ever want to learned something about options. He's a really terrific person. I was reading his newsletters and he was talking about some things and I turned it into an Excel spreadsheet. And uh, that was back in May of 1996. Well, lo and behold, uh, Bloomberg. Bloomberg uses this method. And they call it HRH for historical return histogram. So you can see they're using the same methodology, the same improved methodology that I developed back in 1996. So I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, the thing is, this old method that I just showed you here and he, the, here and here, that it does contain a flaw. Shouldn't say that it contains it contains a flaw, um, and the flaw is it's basically from something a concept called overlap. And what we've done is we have fixed the flaw, and with that we've developed a new way 
to value options, and I'm something I'm very, very proud of. Uh, it's it, now just for what it's worth. The math is very complicated. It is a combination of bootstrapping and a quasi Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, I don't know how many of you folks uh, use Microsoft Excel, but to uh, calculate the value of a single option in Excel, and this is on a fast computer, this is on a, a very fast computer, takes about 45 seconds. Uh, we have software that has taken that process and turned it into seven hundredths of a second. Um, it's 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 pretty impressive what you can do with the with the right hardware. We actually, believe it or not, we use uh, video game cards. Uh, the world's fastest supercomputer uses graphics cards from NVIDIA. So if you like video games, you know that takes a lot of processing to get all that coloration, uh, it, massive amounts of pro, uh, processing. Well, researchers found out that oh my gosh, you can use that for you can use that for um, calculating math, and then they figured out how to program it, and uh, we we use that process, and it. It's, it's just incredibly fast. The, these, these game cards, they literally will calculate trillions, and they, they, they call them in teraflops, floating operations, floating uh, floating point operations. Uh, they call them in teraflops, and these video game cards will process five to six trillion math operations per second. So that's how you're able to get the speed up so fast. Um, what this graph tells you is, you can see this is from SPY from a prior period, and it's telling you how frequently the stock moves just a little bit or a little bit more or down a little bit more and so on and so forth. Here's your bell curve. That's the theoretical expectation. And what you can see is that what, when the stock get, got compressed, when the stock got compressed, the expectation was that the stock was going to stay relatively flat. But what we found out is the stock actually makes large moves more frequently than the theoretical models expect. They actually they're moving huge, far more frequently than the theoretical models expect, and that's really good news if you are putting on a trade with an expectation that the stock is going to make a big move up or down, which is what uh, the straddles, the, the, the long straddles are. So that's, that's really good for, it, for our type of trading. Well, the question is, how good? How good are these, uh, how good are these particular types of trades? And um, I've got an answer. Our option valuation model solves that problem. And this is uh, from our software, the odds option apps software right here. And there's a ticker symbol, the price, and this is the date. There's some expiration dates. This is a graph called the volatility term structure. Over here we have the skew, and then we actually have the option chain down here. And I'm going to zoom in on that option chain, and we are looking at this row right here because we're looking at the at the money, and the 211 is the closest strike price to the at the money, and we've over here we have the bid. And the implied volatility of the bid and the ask, and the implied volatility of the ask, and then we have the value. There's the value right there. And then we have volume, and then over here we have on the put side, we have the bid, implied volatility of the bid, the ask, implied volatility of the ask, and then again, there is the value right there. So that is really that because we're buying, because we're buying. 
we were going to buy at the ask, so we would be buying at 264 and 254, and then that would be that's the price. That that is that's the price. So that's that's uh, which is an important difference. So there's a big difference between price and value, and that's what we're going to compare. The price again 254 and 564. That's 518. That's just 518. But if we go back to the value, 384.54, 394, 40. The value is 778.94. Um, 778.94. So that's the price is much less than the value. So what that tells you is that the options market, and it's proven by this graph right here, the options market was expecting that the market was going to stay relatively normal, but we know that when it gets in that condition, it actually makes much larger moves than normal. So the straddle, if everybody was as wise as we were, the straddle would be priced much higher. It would be priced at 778 instead of 518. So that's that's where we get the that's where we get the 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 I the, the the right price. And so we definitely know that 518 is a good price because it's so much less than the value. Well, I just told you if it's less than the if the price is less than the value, it's a good deal. You might say, well, Don prove it to me. You know, how important is the value and uh, much less how valid is your premise that when a stock gets compressed it's going to do better than the typical straddle. Well, we're going to test it and see. Now folks, we have uh, we have a database that is easily easily the most advanced options database available to retail traders like yourselves. It's the most advanced options database on the planet that's available to retail traders. It, the, the database that we use, um, in fact I think they just worked out a deal with Reuters on some stuff, but uh, New York Stock Exchange uses this database. The International Securities Exchange, which is a very large options exchange, uh, they use this database. You may not realize it, but your brokerage firm, uh, the, the place where your brokerage firm clears trades uses this database. The Depository Trust Clearing Corporation uses this options database. And the reason they use it is because when you place a trade, the brokerage firm doesn't pay, like let's say you buy $100,000 worth of stock, the brokerage firm does not keep $100,000 on deposit with the clearing corporation. They keep a fraction of that. And so Depository Trust Clearing Corporation, which uses, which clears every single stock trade in the United States, and I think they clear all the bond trades, they, they literally clear trillions of trades a year, trillions of trades a year. Um, Depository Trust Clearing Corporation uses this database to determine the margin level that a brokerage firm needs to uh, keep with them. So it's it's a really advanced database and we've got all the data from 1998 and we're going to do a little test. Front. And I mean, it's every single options that's ever traded since 1998 is in this database. And we're going to do a little test. We're going to test all signals. So this, we're going to test, we're going to look for, we're going to look for this. This is odds volatility compression. We're going to look for this. And we're going to look at it for all optionable stocks over the entire history 
from 2002 through 2014, and we're going to say what we're, we're, what we're, that, that's what we're looking for, and we're going to get all, we're going to get every one of those signals, and then we're going to do it again for equity options only. We are not going to do it for an index or ETF. So this is just equity options only. And then what we're going to do, we're going to create a straddle for each one of those, and we're going to look for 21 to 49 days. Well, when you look at the whole universe, there are 5,400 of these straddle trades. So over the all the all the stocks that are listed, there are 5,400 signals over the course of 2002 to 2014. And we're going to make an assumption. We're going to assume that you hold this to the straddle till expiration. So no fancy exit signals or anything like that. We're just going to buy a straddle and hold it till expiration. And then we're going to calculate calculate the return for each one of those 5,400 straddles. And then we're going to calculate the average return of all of these trades. So it's only something that we are capable of doing because we're one of the few, well, I shouldn't say that because Goldman Sachs has access to this database and, you know, every every other uh, hedge fund, large institution has access to this database. Uh, we are, by the way, the only company on the planet that is allowed to provide this information to retail traders, kind of like uh, uh, Metastock is the only company that's allowed to provide Zenith to their uh, to to retail traders. So it's, it's like we have a little exclusive arrangement with the with the retail side here. But anyway, we're the only place where retail traders are going to be able to get access to information like this. And what we so what we find, let's just we're going to do some benchmarking. And that's what this is all about. We're going to benchmark and check the performance. The average profit of a one month at the money S&P 500 index straddle, any time. So we're just going to like we're just going to buy a one month straddle, just blindly buy it. So uh, March options expiration, we're going to buy an April stra at the money straddle. April options expiration, we're going to buy a May at the money straddle. We're going to do that. And we're going to, oh, from the period 1998 to 2014, and just measure the return. What's the average return of those straddles? The average return is minus 10.3% per month, or a minus 73% per year. Now, this doesn't surprise me at all, and anybody that's traded options for a length of time knows this, that options buyers have the probabilities, they have the odds stacked against them. So there's no surprise that the straddles are getting crushed. So now we're going to compare the fact that straddle buyers tend to get crushed if they're just randomly picking options, uh, ra randomly picking straddle purchases, the straddle buyers get crushed. But what if you say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this only when there's a signal. And remember, there's 5,400 of these where we've, gotten, where we've gotten signals. Well, how have they done? Well, from January 2002 through December 2014, the average return was plus 2.3% per month or 31% a year. So remember, this is no value. We're not considering value yet. This is just when you get one of those compression signals, if you buy a call and a put that is about one month in duration and hold it till expiration, how much money do you make? About 2.3% per month. Now, that does not include commissions, but it does include slippage. Uh, but that that's, that's a huge improvement. It's not... Great, but it's a massive improvement. You've just gone from minus 73% per year to plus 31% per per year. So that's a, just an absolutely gigantic improvement. But now we're going to add 
the value component. And so what we're going to do is this is a, a type of study that's widely done in academic research, and I do I, I do a lot of academic research. Uh, pay, I pay very close attention to uh, academic research, and one of the things that they do is they like to break things down into what they call um, they like to break things down into what they call uh, deciles and the, the little port ten, ten different portfolios. So you have a you you come up with a uh, what they call a sort uh, a, a variable, and then you sort on the variable. And then you break it down into ten portfolios based on the variable. Well, our portfolios, our variable is going to be that price value ratio. So we're going to take the price of the straddle and divide it by the value, and we're going to get the ratio, and we're going to do that five thousand four hundred times. And then we're going to sort it, and we're going to divide we're going to divide the 5,400 into deciles. So we're going to have 540 in one decile, and 540 in another decile, 540 in another decile, and so on and so forth. And then for each decile that has 540, we're going to calculate the performance of each straddle, and then we're going to calculate the average performance of each decile. And that comes up with something that looks a little bit like this. This is the average monthly return. We're taking the price divided by the fishback option value, and that's our ratio. And we're going to compare it to the average return at expiration. So here are the deciles. One, two, and so these are the cheap ones down here, and these are the expensive ones right here. And in decile one, so the cheapest ones, the ones where the, the value was lower than the, the most, had the biggest discount, how about that way? The straddles that where the price had the biggest discount to the fishback option value, they made 22.9% per month. Now, I don't know about you. But I've been doing this long enough that it's like 22.9% a month. Are you kidding me? That's 1,087% per year annualized. Now, I'm not promising 1,087% per year because you definitely don't want to put all your money in just one trade and then have it have it blow up and you know do that 10 times a year, 12 times a year, and then have it blow up and then you're wiped out. But it just shows you what it's capable of doing. Uh, 20, this is almost 23% per month. That is a gigantic, that's a gigantic number in the options trading. Even this, this next decile is uh, about 12% a month. Even these are good. But then one, as you can see, we start getting into the negative returns as the options get more expensive. And this is what's known as a monotonic uh, uh, regression because they are, this one's highest, this one's next highest, next highest, and so on and so forth. And it's working its way down what they call monotonically. And that's represented by this uh, uh, correlation coefficient over here, uh, 76%. That means that 76% of the relationship can be explained by this variable right here. So the price to value ratio explains 76% of the performance. So that's a really, really, really important thing. And cheap, as they like to, as I like to say, uh, cheap is good. So here's the system is relatively simple. You search for compressed stocks, and you can use Metastock to do that very easily. And our add-on makes it even easier than that. And then you analyze straddles on compressed stocks, 
and then you implement straddles on compressed stocks when the price is significantly below the value. And then what we do, what we tend to do is we just hold till ex expiration and then exit the in the money option before the market closes on expiration day. You can, and I have gotten fancier than that at times, but I found that it the, the exit really is, in a lot of situations, the, the entry and exit are critical. But in this one, the the exit is really not as not as critical. So um, anyway, those are the rules. And for any of you who want to get in contact with us about this, here is our contact information. Um, again, my name is Don Fishback, and there's the phone number and the email address. And I'm just about done. So, Jeff, are you there? Hello. Hello, Jeff. I'm here, yeah. Sounds good. Great job, uh, Don. We don't have a lot of questions that have come through. Um, we did have a, a few that I was able to answer uh, uh, independently, but thanks for the presentation. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, we, uh, I just want to kind of talk a little bit about, oh, and I need to take over control from you. Please do. Uh, let's see, change the presenter to me. Okay. Anne asked a question. Actually, I'm going to show this, Anne, and, and Ken asked a similar question as well. How do you use the cone? How do you draw that on the chart? And I'm actually going to show that to you. In fact, I'll show that to you right now. You should be able to see odds compression for options, which is kind of the name of the product that we developed with Don. And um, let's go ahead and kind of switch over into my Metastock program here, and I'll just show you how to draw this on. And as, as we do that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how the product is actually put together and kind of how it works and that kind of stuff. So looks like that didn't come up with Metastock. Let's do that. Okay. So I've got a chart of Apple. There's a couple of templates that are included with this particular add-on. There's basically it shows you all of the indicators and uh, that kind of stuff. Um, there's two different versions of the template. So for example, if I go to apply template here, uh, that's not what I meant to do. If I go to apply template here, I can show you the two different versions of the uh, templates that are included. There's uh, basically two. There's a compression in bars and a, just a compression. The difference is one of them is a line chart for your charts and the other one is bars, and that's really the only difference. The templates that are included, uh, the templates do include the moving averages uh, that Don was talking about. They include the compression ratio that Don was talking about, and then this uh, signal indicator. Also, one of the things that's kind of cool about it is when one of the that compression signal actually happens on the chart, it's actually going to draw that. It's going to say OVC, which means odds volatility compression on the chart for you. So if we drill into this a little bit, I'm just going to kind of zoom in on this area and show you how to draw the cone. In Metastop, basically, um, you've got your drawing tools that are available here. Well, there's going to be this odds volatility cone, or this odds probability. Probability, yes, probability. <laughs> I was just testing you, making sure you're still listening, Don. I am. <laughs> If you don't see this, uh, just keep in mind this rotates, so there's different options. Just rotate it until you see the probability cone. And if you want to draw that on your chart, just click on it. We can go basically go ahead and draw it on any of the bars that we want to, just based on where we drop it. So if we want to Look draw Look at how that thing skyrocketed, right? That... Yeah, it reloads data on me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where'd it go? Well, let's refresh that. Um, and uh, okay, yeah, what happened here? Huh. Well, interesting. It only doesn't work when I'm trying to show it, right? Um, okay. The, which isn't uncommon either. Just. Let me see if we're actually responsive here. If something happened to the data set when I went to do that, and in fact I crashed, so not a big deal. It does generally tend to happen once and uh, occasionally. Let me go ahead and turn this off, and we'll start up Metastock because I want to just show you how to do that. Go ahead and click on cancel there, and we'll go ahead and let it. 
John asked a question that we can answer while this is restarting. I am on a yes, little bit ahead. of a backup computer, which is old. So, but uh, John asked a question: Once price shows direction itself, do you lift the losing side of the straddle? And in your, I, um, I can tell you what I do. Yeah, tell us what you do. Um, the, the answer is no, uh, because, uh, John, every time I thought I was smart enough that I was able to predict the direction, um, so let's say the stock breaks out to the upside, and because I can remember it was Lamb Research. I'll never forget this. It was Lamb Research, It was, it was, was, which is a long time ago. But you sometimes you just remember your your wounds in in, in the in the trading battle. You remember your wounds better. But the stock was the stock broke out to the upside, and I said, "Oh my gosh, you know what I'm going to do? I am going to sell my puts and I'm going to hold on to my calls." Well, the moment I did that, it was like the market knew that Don only had calls and no puts. And the stock immediately turned around and went to the downside. So I, so I, it broke to the upside, right? So that means the puts were losing, and I sold them at a at a loss, not a big loss, but at a loss. And then the stock took a nosedive, and I lost on the calls. So I actually forecasted volatility correctly, and I got it within the right time frame because remember with options you've got to get the expiration right so I did it within the proper time frame so I got the magnitude right and I got the expiration right and I lost on both options not just on one I lost <laughs> on both of them so the, the, the bottom line is I don't I, I don't do that anymore it, it hurts too much it's, it's a good That's example not, Oh, go ahead, that's sorry. not the, I was gonna say that's not to say that somebody who's smarter than I am in the directional side can't refine it and expand upon this. You know, that's one of the great things about Metastock is that there are so many tools available that somebody could take this basic uh, compression tool and build upon it to include direction and they might be able to do something wonderful with it uh, but that's I'm, I'm not that guy I'm the volatility guy not the direction guy um, uh, David asked does this work with end of day or real time it's suited for I mean it will work in real time or DC version of the program the thing is is it's kind of a daily based system uh, we're looking at um, I can't remember what we're looking back to find the biggest squeeze that has happened in like three years, right, Don? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's even further back than that. It's 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 four years. Four but, years. Yeah, but Jeff, one of the other things I wanted, we, it's not that it can't work on it. It's just that I don't have, I can tell you how this thing performs on an end of day basis, because that's what all those charts showed. What I can't do is say. Does it work on an end of day or real time intraday? I don't know. I, I just I don't know the answer to it. It might. I hope it does. You remember whoever how... asked that question, whoever asked that question is gonna have to email me and say, Hey Don, guess what it works. <laughs> yeah. You do need a thousand records, so so that may work on a sixty minute type of an interval and that kind of stuff, but you do need a thousand records. In Definitely order to need a thousand power records. Power the study. So um, you'll need to look at the longer time frames of uh, intraday data. Um, my wound is orange juice. Sorry to hear that, John. <laughs> and um, like you were saying before earlier, uh, Don, look at the kind of the explosive growth that happened. This is just Apple. Just pulled this up because I always show Apple. It's like showing the Dow. It's one of the stocks that you always kind of look at when you want to show people examples. Look at the breakout that we had after this. Uh, volatility compression right here and then you kind of look at this historical example and another example to why you might have thought it was going to start to go down and then it broke up huge um, another reason to keep both of those positions on the on the on the sidelines here's another example of where that compression just got so tight and then yeah, and if you get the scale if you get the scale right that thing's going to be a gigantic move right here 
so yeah, yeah. There's uh, it's definitely you know uh, it's kind of like winding that spring is the way a lot of people like to talk about it. You look until you know the buyers and sellers can't seem to break out into a certain direction. Let's try and draw that probability cone on the chart again. Again, so what you're going to do is just decide on where you want it, and boom. And that time. I was able to do it without any consequences. <laughs> and then most of the time, that's the case. It's a hard to see, just hard to see blue. Yeah, and you know, if you want to change the color, just click on it here, and you can come into color and style, and we can make it that nice, big, vibrant orange that you were looking at too. So that's pretty easy to change around, obviously. So yeah. With the uh, so, we've actually automatically drawn these on the on the actual chart for you. Uh, the other thing that we do have is obviously with a Metastock add-on, we want to tell you what to do with that. So we went in there, Don created some commentary. I think I coded this. Uh, it might have been my programmer that made this part of it. Uh, I'm having him do more programming and me do less because that generally helps with my state of mind. But if we click on this, we, it's actually going to tell us, uh, give us kind of exactly the options that we should take on it. So right here, it'll tell us there's a current action in stock indicates extreme compression. Kind of tells you exactly how they're coming to that, or how we're coming to that. Uh, this means option strategy is designed to make money out of the stock breaks, out of the narrow range are appropriate. You should be looking at option purchases and a straddle. And it kind of gives you a lot more detail on that. We basically kind of put a lot of really good information in there because you're going to watch this one hour seminar, you're going to go in, you're going to want to be able to apply this, you're going to want to be able to have Don sitting there at your desk telling you exactly what you should be looking at and this is pretty close to that, it's basically telling you to how to how to structure that trade and what options and what puts to look at. So in addition... I'm, very proud, I'm, I'm really proud of it, it's, 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 it really is like having a coach right there. And of course, you know, obviously one of the things that you want to be able to do is find them, you know, with this. Really think about the scenario that you're looking for. You're looking for something that's been the lowest uh, that it's been for four years. Obviously, this is going to be a selective thing. So while you could come in here and look for this OVC to be happening on, you know, the 4,000 optionable stocks or the ETFs or those type of things, obviously where uh, it's probably a little bit easier to go in and actually look at the two that happened today. And that's exactly how many happened today. So if we come back into the Power Console, what we're going to have is I'll click on the scan right here, and um, it's just going to be called, for those of you that I know there's, most of you know how to do this, you already have Metastock, uh, but the, the actual scan is called the Odds Volatility Compression, okay, so you just click on that. For those of you that haven't run a lot of scans in Metastock or that haven't got Metastock yet, you just come in here and tell it what you want to scan against. So obviously you want something to be optionable. A lot of the ETFs are optionable to kind of answer the questions of with the, will this work with ETFs. Obviously you're looking at the non-directional play, so you want to be able to buy a put and you want to be able to buy a call on it, right? So to have all of the optional stocks right here, you can just click on this and have them. Most of the ETFs are optionable. I, I do diamonds and spider options all the time. To scan against that, you just click on that and you notice it'll, you can just select as many of these different categories as you want. You go ahead and what you do is run this on the interval that you want. Uh, you can start the exploration. I'm not going to run it now because it takes a few minutes, but I did run it against the optionables uh, as Don was starting to talk today. And if we come in here, I can just show you what the reports looks like. And out of the 4,300, the 62 stocks that we scanned, uh, these are the two that actually came up today. To be honest, I've already looked at these charts. I didn't like them that much. Uh, I can go ahead and show you what they look like. We can go ahead and open them from right here. But that's also okay. Again, if that's what we're looking for today, this China looked okay. It's had quite a few compressions. It just didn't, I didn't like it. Don might have a different view on it. I didn't like it. The other one that I uh, that came up today was this Intelli Holdings had a, a volatility compression today. Again, it wasn't something I really, really thought would be great. Although Don might have a different opinion on that one as well. But that's even okay because instead of spending 
all that time looking at 4,300 stocks, I know the two that have a compression, if there's something that, hey, screams to me, this is a good trade, I can go ahead and take that trade. Otherwise, I'm done for the day. Yeah, hey, Jeff, can I speak about this in, in, tel, in, in Telos? Um, because that's one thing that, that one thing I do want to emphasize is that it's critical that you check the news on these things because what you see right there that's a takeover that stock went up to nine dollars somebody's decided to pay that somewhere around nine fifty maybe you know maybe nine forty nine fifty for cash and that stock has gone pancake flat and there's nothing that's going to cause it to go up there's nothing that's causing it to go down they've agreed to a price so it's at that price now I can tell you this those options are they, they may not even be traded because uh, and that's the other thing I think if you look in the instructions over there on the left when you had Apple up there it talks about looking for a certain amount of volume you know we want to see a certain amount of volume because if you don't have enough volume you've got a liquidity problem in terms of well they'll let you in but they won't let you out um, let's see. Does it scroll on down a little bit further? And um, right here, there's there where it says, right there. looking to take advantage of this trade should have make sure. That's the first mistake I ever made in options was I was the only buyer of that option, <laughs> which you don't want to be in that position and have it go out of the money on you. Um, have a reasonable bid ask spread. Have at least 500 contracts open interest or trade at least 50 contracts a day. It's also yeah, so that's yeah, so that's, you know, talking about having somebody, the, the coach is right there giving you the instructions on on this. You know, make sure, you know, this is what you need to watch out for. Don, uh, uh, Brad asks, is this a system that you use? Are you making a living with this system? I, I use it. I will not say that I'm making a living uh, the, the, off of this. I make a living off of this and others. Um, the one that I probably do more than anything because these things they, they don't come up they don't come up every day they you get these stock compressions you typically get a stock compression every day but when you I'll give you an example if you the, the uh, second week of January this year that that second week of January when the market took the huge nosedive in the first week of January and then the second week you just weren't going to find a flat stock. So for consistency, I tend to do credit spreads on the uh, S&P 500 depository receipts. So between the two of them, this is the bulk of what I do. But is this the is this a, do I do this exclusively to make a living? The answer is no. Okay. Perfect. One of the things I wanted to point out too is you always say check the news, and obviously if you have a, Zenith, the real-time data feed for Metastock, you have plenty of really good news. But even if you have Metastock DC and you're looking at a chart like this and you want to see what the company news is, one of the things that you can do is just right-click right here, go to um, Research and Quotes, and just click on it, and it's going to take you to the company news, and you can see oh, what's sweet. going on with that. So that's what I did it. not know that. <laughs> well, with you, I would recommend, since you have Zenith, to look at Zenith News, because this will just take you to the Reuters homepage and load up their company news that they list on the website. Obviously, Zenith's going to be a little bit more complete, but yeah, this is a great way to actually pull up the news on Nintelos or whatever symbol you're looking at. So, awesome. Okay, um, and again, and you're throwing in some free time to the option apps as well, right? So yes, that software, that software that we uh, I, I was showing. Um, that anybody that purchases the add-on will get a free period, and that goes through the end of March. So through March 31st, uh, they will get a free access to our software. Uh, I'm glad that you said that because I was a little bit nervous that I had this slide incorrect right here <laughs> where it says end of March. So I'm glad you kind of said that and that I had it correct. Otherwise, I would be kind of typing really quickly here. So yes, the... I could fix that, Jeff. No, it's through, the end, it's through the end of March. Okay. So normally, odds compression for options that Don Fish back out on is a one-time cost. It's not a monthly cost. We get that question a lot. You pay for it one time. 
It's normally $4.99 because you came to today's webinar. It's only $3.99. It does include our money back guarantee so you can evaluate it and you can play with it and make sure that it's going to work well for you. Um, it's also going to include, and you have to do this this week, you have until Friday to do this, but it's going to include access to option apps through the end of March and Options Apps is a very, very cool application. And Don talked a, lot, a, a little bit about it, but really I, the thing I like most about it is you can go in there and figure out what the fair price for the option that you're buying should be, whether you're getting that discounted or not. Did I say that correctly, Don? You said it perfectly. Okay, so in, in, in any case, uh, give us a call. Uh, phone number is 800-882-3040. We probably have some guys still on the phone, even though it's just after five right now. Or um, drop us a, a, a chat at metastock.com. Now, I did mess that up. Just type metastock properly here, slash sales chat, if you want to chat online with one of them. And um, let's see if there's any last-minute questions. Uh, and... Uh, I really appreciate you guys coming today. Let's see. Where's my go? Oh, there it is. Okay. Where's my overlay? Uh, Dave asked a question that has to do with fulfillment. How do you get the options app after you purchase the add-on? Go ahead and place your uh, purchase for the add-on. Again, you'll want to do that between now and Friday. I will personally email you a link to take advantage of that options app for a free time. Brad, uh, let's see, for your question, I just have you get a hold of me, and, um, and uh, I'll give you my email here, uh, which for all of you guys is... Uh, jeffrey.gibby at metastock.com if you want to reach out to me directly. Uh, Ken asks a question uh, for Don. Are you still here, Don? I am still here. Okay. So do you, do you personally trade SPX or SPY? SPY. That's a, gr that's a really good question. I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that. Um, I trade SPY and I uh, the reason why I trade it, I trade it because it's physical delivery, uh, where the SPX is cash settled, and the other thing is when the options expire. The SPX options expire, uh, well, I shouldn't say when they expire, when the price is determined at which the option settlement value is determined is not the close. So SP, SPY options are like any other option. It's Friday at 4 o'clock and it's physical delivery. The uh, SPX options stop trading on Thursday before the third Friday of the month and then the exercise value, uh, the, the, the settlement value is determined by what they call an opening rotation of the prints. So it's a complex method and when things get chaotic on a Friday morning, uh, they, it, it, it can really cause problems and I don't want that. So, I mean, SPX options are good, believe me. They, they are very widely used institutionally, but for most people, SPY is my preferred vehicle. Uh, do you do you ever use this with commodity options? I think I know the answer to this one, Don. I have I have never tried it. Okay. So again, with it, as with anything, like Don can come in and say exactly how well he's doing with this, and it's like anything else. You know, play with it for a little bit on paper, and then always take a position. You know, even when I'm adding something new to my strategies, right? I'll always take one of each. You know, if I'm doing a spread uh, and it's the first time I've done something, I'll take one put, uh, one call. You know, uh, you can kind of phase into it as you get more and more comfortable with it. And I think that's important. It really is, Jeff. That's, you know, if you're trying something new, start small, get comfortable with it, or get uncomfortable with it and quit. I mean, one of the two. So uh, don't don't ever... Don't, don't be a plunger right out of the gate. 
Robert says, will this uh, be available? How long is the offer available for? I want to rec review the recording first. That's fine. The offer, f uh, including the free month of options apps, is good through Friday. And we will send you the recording tomorrow, Robert. So that'll give you a little bit of time. And there is a money back guarantee on it so you can play with it. So if you're kind of on the fence, well, you know, it's a good way to try it. You can always, uh, you're going to like it. And uh, you do have that a little bit of insurance in case you don't like it. I think people will like it. You know, just one, one of the other fellows asked a, a question earlier. I think people will actually like it, not just from an options trading perspective, but to just look for breakout opportunities. Because, and then they can put their own directional, just because I don't do that doesn't mean it's, it's wrong. Um, I'm just, I tend to be a volatility guy. But I think there are people that will be able to use it to spot opportunities for potential directional breakouts. And I really, I'd like to hear back from anybody that, that finds that it, it's useful for that. I was talking to a guy yes, uh, last week, um, and the, the, uh, the, the people that I've talked to about the odds compression that have it really, really like it. There's one thing that you need to understand with this product. You are looking for something that's extremely selective. So you're not necessarily going to, it's like today, we didn't have a great trade today. You know, there was, there was two stocks and of those two, well, I didn't like either one of them, which is fine, you know, because I'd much rather step over mediocre opportunities, if you would, to really get the opportunities that are good. So I'm actually, I'm actually typing my email address. I almost gave my Gmail address, which I don't use. So anyway, here's my email address in case you need it, Dave. So I think that's a good thing. You know, maybe you get three signals a week. How many do you need? Right. That are really, it, really good. And the, you don't, you don't get a lot of signals per stock, but because there are four thousand optionable stocks out there, you still end up with a fair number of signals each week. But it's going to be different, it's, and it's going to be a lot of names that you've never heard of. No problem, Dave. Thanks for coming, everybody. I think we're going to close it down for yeah, now. Thank you. Uh, Don, good. great job. Thank uh, you. Any, any last words for us? No, just uh, I, I encourage everybody to give it a try. It's, it's a great product. I want to thank Daryl Guppy for coming up with that move, whatever he calls the MMA uh, template, I want to thank him for that because without him doing that, I wouldn't have gotten the inspiration for uh, turning it into an options trading uh, methodology. So I want to thank him for uh, the good work that he does down in Australia. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming today. And... Um... Uh, that's it. We're going to call it for today. Uh, let us know if there's any questions that you have, and we'll, we'll see you at the next one.